why do humans think they're so special and why are we um, why do we think we're so superior than all the other animals other non-human animals because we're animals too in a world that seems to be losing its way we search for inspirational people and stories hoping to find traces of our future this is backlight welcome to a future in which Everybody has a voice. For a long time, we humans have thought of ourselves as the height of all life on Earth. We are smart. Animals are dumb. But in recent years, animals have managed to surprise us more and more. We see videos of octopuses not letting themselves be pushed around. Is that a girl? Crows and otters solving puzzles. Magpies cleaning up our mess in exchange for food? Or whales that turn out to have a complicated language? What a time to be alive. That these fantasy stories that we used to tell children about talking animals that you could understand. My daughter, I think it's very possible she would be able to talk to animals. We're learning to understand the language of animals better. But does that mean we see them differently? You don't have to be like a human to be impressive in some dimension or another, right? You don't have to look like a human. You don't have to do it the way a human would to be intelligent. Should they get rights? These. <laughs> That's a difficult question. Do we see animals that are cute or pretty or useful differently? Or does it go for all animals and their habitat? Listening to the voice of nature may be the biggest challenge of the next few decades. If we listened more carefully, what would we discover? seeing it above me in the air, coming down and thinking, I'm going to die now. And then I was underwater, and somehow I was not in the kayak anymore, and I could just see white. I opened my eyes underwater and it was just white. And then I was kind of thrown around, and I think that was the whale using its tail to swim away, and I think we just got caught in the eddy. He knocked it over. He knocked it over, the kayak, look at that. And then I was quite deep underwater. I had to swim back up to the surface. And then I got up and I looked around and I saw, I thought Charlotte was dead for sure because the well had landed on top of her, I thought. Um, but she was there and she was fine and we were both totally unharmed. The other really kind of intense encounter was in the Dominican Republic. Humpbacks, even though they're very big, they have a very impressive awareness of how, where the edges of their bodies are. And because they have these big pectoral fins, they can move really gracefully. And so the whales would come right up and they would look at you with their eye and then they would turn and they would put their arm, their pectoral fin out and it would come past and it would be like this far from you. But they never touched you. And they would go down and then they would sing these long songs. They're like 25 minutes long. And they have repeated units in it, like music and structures like music. And you can start to hear tunes in it. 
And so you would be on the surface looking down and underneath you this, this gigantic animal singing and the sound goes through the water and it vibrates your chest and your, like, your mask is vibrating and all the air spaces, the whole body is just moving with the song of these animals. And then the whale will finish the song, come to the surface, breathe for like a few moments and then go down again and it will repeat the exact same song again. And when you sit there for an hour or so, you start to recognize the same repeating patterns. It becomes familiar to you and you start to really understand that it is a kind of music. If whales really do sing, what do they sing about? Artificial intelligence works increasingly well in the translation of human languages. Could it work for animals too? One of the biggest problems in understanding animals is understanding their communications. It's hard to record them, and we find it hard to find patterns in there. Like if they have a language, it's very hard for humans to see it because we are trapped in our own language. These machines don't have that problem. They can go through more like recordings of sounds than a human could listen to in a lifetime, and they can perceive patterns in huge recordings that humans cannot. And then when you, when you correlate that with what the animals are doing, who they are, what the context is, what else is happening, then you can start to make hypotheses about what these communications mean. And when you do that, you can start to have a different way in to animal communications than the way we would have before. And we can take these tools that we've developed for finding patterns in our own communications and find them in the patterns of other animals. While he was writing his book on whales, Tom came across a large-scale study into the language of sperm whales. The researchers used artificial intelligence to map their findings. One of the researchers is Michael Bronstein. And that's how it sounds. Michael is a computer scientist. He tries to discover patterns in sperm whale sounds. He recently saw his first sperm whale in real life. A bit, I should say, a bit scary and a bit, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, a humbling experience. Such a big animal, very majestic. What you see here are uh, different colors. Different colors represent different animals, different whales. And the color here consists of uh, five clicks. What changes is uh, its duration over time. And then uh, there is some synchronous behavior. Different whales produce similarly looking sounds. And there is some kind of following behavior here between, uh, between these two whales, the, the red and the, and the green. So they're talking. Yep at the same time. One of the things that we are trying to understand is if there is any planning. So if there is a conversation that they discuss, for example, how to forage, how to, to, to hunt the, the, the giant squids in their next dive, and basically what precedes the decision to dive. So at some point they stop chatting and then they start diving. So there might be some patterns that are typical for, for this decision. Then another thing is we can, obviously we can try to communicate back. So we can have a chatbot that, that like human chatbots, right? So they, uh, they don't really, you cannot say that they really understand, right? So, uh, but they produce a plausible output that you can interact with this chatbot and even think that this, this is a human. So it potentially even passes the, the Turing test of, of intelligence. So probably something like this can be done with whales. So we would be able to, to have a device that communicates with the whale, the whale responds. And by uh, basically by recording this communication, we hope to, to, to be able maybe to understand better the meaning of, of, the, the, of what they say. But aren't you afraid that you will insult them by accident? That's a good question. So uh, yeah, potentially it's possible. Uh, it might also change their behavior or disrupt the, the, the way that they live. So yeah, there are probably more dire implications, right, than, than just insulting. Uh, for sure we'll be very careful in, if we ever do it. It is probably the craziest project that I have ever seen. So it's uh, just the question itself uh, from my childhood. So uh, fairy tales and, and stories about where people would normally communicate to, to animals. I think 
people have always wondered about whether this is possible and uh, whether we could communicate to, to, to animals, uh, regarding animals as, uh, as our peers, rather than uh, abusing them or killing them. So I think if we find something like this, like, like uh, whale uh, or non-human species communication or language, we understand that these are intelligent animals that, 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 that can talk and then can express themselves. I hope it will also change the way that, that we treat animals uh, eventually. Galpa Yagedona published an astonishing study last year that demonstrates how bees love to play. What's happening? She's rolling a ball. So there are some bees that once they move one ball, then they'll try another one. So now it's playing. Yeah. <laughs> she has no reason to do this, right? Exactly. And as you can see, the bee can definitely avoid the balls. There is a lot of space to walk around them. She's not getting any food for doing this or any other obvious function. So she loves this. <laughs> Looks like. <laughs> What we're doing is taking these creatures into the lab and giving them a task that they've never experienced before. And we're asking, okay, uh, <laughs> show me what you got. How far can you go? Um, and so it really tells us that, okay, just because you didn't happen to see it in the wild because maybe they're too busy surviving, doesn't mean they're not capable of it. Doesn't mean their brain doesn't have the capacity to solve these seemingly complex tasks. And so I, I can't help it. <laughs> it's, uh, I want to learn more and more about them. Like, what can they do with their tiny brains? Uh, because actually they're quite clever creatures. And even if their brain might not be as big as ours or other mammals, they have actually quite sophisticated learning abilities, they can make memories and they can solve problems, which is of course important for survival. And then you see all these individual differences, it's impossible not to wonder whether they might feel something. It doesn't mean that they feel the way we do, but is there some kind of emotion-like experience? Uh, is there some kind of subjective experience? Um, and so these are very uh, fascinating and cool questions to ask. We know that bees are necessary for pollination, but they can do much more. They count, they recognize people's faces, they use tools, and they learn bee dances. By dancing, they indicate where food can be found. The duration of the dance indicates how far away the food is, and the direction of the dance shows which way they should fly in relation to the sun. First of all, it's mind-blowing in itself. And so this sort of sophisticated um, symbolic communication is not found in other non-human animals, actually. Is it a language? I think, I, I think that's debated. Uh, so it's definitely a form of communication, but say some people would say that language has more component and is a bit more complex than uh, the waggle dance. I mean, maybe it would be strange for a human to perform a waggle dance to show, <laughs> to show where to go, right? It's, maybe right. it's not relevant to our uh, way of life, like our ecology. But for the honeybees, that maybe is the most effective form of communication. But it's also just simply fascinating that other creatures see the world completely different to us. And so these findings of animals feeling some kind of pleasure, some kind of suffering, then points into the direction that, okay, these are sentient beings, these 
might have some kind of consciousness. And so there is some duty for us to maybe translate this into policies uh, to do something about um, looking after them and protecting them legally. What should we do? <laughs> mm. So, personally, I think I've always wondered why do humans think they're so special? And why are we, um, why do we think we're so superior than all the other animals, other non human animals, because we're animals too? Should they get rights? Bees. <laughs> That's a difficult question. In recent years, scientists have made one discovery after another about animals. Mice can feel when other mice are sad. Cows have best friends and experience stress when they're separated. Elephants communicate with each other across huge distances and they mourn their dead. And since it's now proven that octopuses experience pain, there is a new law in the United Kingdom that recognises them as sentient beings. Well, there is evidence that the octopus is a very clever creature and it can solve uh, certain tasks, solve problems and looks uh, like a sophisticated animal. And with bees, I would say we're not that far off in terms of what we're discovering about cognition and this growing new evidence of something like pleasure or something like pain. But I would say if it worked for the octopus, we will probably get that with bees as well. But whether that gets translated to policy in practice, I don't have the answer for that. How do you write a law like that? Where do you draw the line? Which animals do we feel compassion for? And how good should life be for them? Now, remember, Frederick, they can jump. So, we're going to be careful. You're going to be all right. I know. They are going to jump. They're going to jump, but that's OK if they do jump. Impossible. They are totally beautiful. Look at these. Look at them. Amazing. Lots of folks are animal lovers, first and foremost, you know? They adore their cats. They love spending time with their dogs. They you know, love watching nature documentaries. That's never been me. Lots of people are animal people, by which they mean they really like certain animals, right? They love their cockatoo, they love their cat, they are thrilled about their pet fish, uh, and they devote tremendous amount of resources and care and concern and time and attention to the well-being of these animals. And they really are invested in making things go well for those particular animals under their care. And that's marvelous. I look at that as someone who is not particularly concerned with any certain kind of animal, but with just animals in general and say, but you know, how many more chickens are there than cats, right? How many more shrimp are there than dogs? Dogs and cats aren't even a rounding error in the total number of animals we're raising for food. And so if you're trying to think, where can you do the most good? Where can you have the greatest impact? Where do we need to invest our time and energy? I always think, it's in the farmed animals. Biodiversity is in danger all over the globe. Only 4% of mammals on our planet are wild animals. The largest component by far in terms of mammals is livestock intended for consumption. But do these animals experience pleasure? Do they feel shame, jealousy, or curiosity? What if they experience post-traumatic stress or fears? Bob Fisher works on a moral weight index that rates animals based on the scientific answers to questions like these. Pigs, for example, do actually experience PTSS. They enjoy learning things may feel lonely sometimes, and get bored. But we don't know if pigs feel such a thing as pride. 
This research continues to give us deeper insights into the emotional life of the animals we eat. And so now policymakers have to decide, okay, well, what compromises are we gonna accept in terms of animal welfare for the sake of certain environmental benefits and for the sake of satisfying human demands? And of course, we're not talking about one kind of animal, we're talking about multiple. So all these trade-offs have to get made. And since they've gotta get made, we gotta come up with tools for making them. And the tools that we wanna use are the tools of policy, the tools that allow for animals to enter into the conversation. <laughs> Oh yeah, there's some real interest around here. You can tell, people are excited. Studying which animals suffer which kind of pain, you soon come against strange dilemmas. Oh, black soldier fly. Yes. Like using black soldier flies as an alternative to chicken feed made of imported soy. Believe me, I'm very familiar with black soldier are flies. Are some animals more important? And if so, how much more important? We've actually been looking at issues about the welfare of the black soldier flies themselves in the production facilities. If it turns out that black soldier flies are sentient, they're conscious and can feel things, then what we're talking about is raising an extraordinary number of individuals to feed a smaller number of individuals to feed humans and suddenly this thing looks pretty bleak. Now, of course, I mean, lots of people, understandably at this point, are just gonna flinch and say, I mean, look, come on, come on. The black soldier flies, really, that's what you're worried about, you know? There's war in the Ukraine, we're talking about black soldier flies. I understand that reaction. I mean, of course, of course. Um, I don't want to make it sound as though you know, we should be maximally confident that the black soldier fly larvae are suffering extremely and that we should you know, reallocate all resources um, to their interests. That being said, I also don't wanna be someone who says, uh, this idea is ridiculous and so I'm not gonna take it seriously when we know so little. Can you show how much we don't know? Oh, well, the gray in that picture is telling us how much we don't know. And of course, what we don't know is most of it. But if we know so little about these farmed animals, is it not too soon? Well, it's too soon if we didn't have to make choices, right? So the question of how to make trade-offs between animals um, is especially pressing because we, in fact, have the trade-offs to make. If we didn't, if this was just a purely theoretical question, then of course the right thing to do would be to say, well, not yet. You know, like wait till more, more data is in. This is not the time to be building these kinds of models. This is not the time to be building these kinds of frameworks. But that's not our situation. In fact, people make these sorts of choices all the time. And policymakers in particular have to make judgment calls. Many of the characteristics on the list are things we would have described as uniquely human only a few decades ago. Does a lobster understand the notion of death? Can a goat be jealous? Does a chicken experience pleasure? Farm Sanctuary offers shelter to animals from the production industry, but also conducts studies in a stress-free environment. Yeah, he's a little shy. He loves butt scratches, but he's just a little nervous. It's okay, Elliot, honey. We have a number of escapees, cows, goats, and sheep who have come from live markets and are just found on the streets. Um, a lot of times they make the news <laughs> because the police are like trying to catch them. Oh, she's very outgoing. Hi, honey, are you gonna prove me wrong? Hi. They had a radio that they could turn on and off or like recorded music with buttons that they could turn on and off. We have a rooster whose favorite was Taylor Swift. Um, and then there's a turkey, his favorite is K, he likes the K-pop. It depends, we try a variety. We have all sorts of creative solutions to keep them like feeling calm and safe.
Is this an overly humane treatment of animals? At Farm Sanctuary, they're convinced that animals have humanity. Here we refer to all the residents as people, just because they're our friends, our family, and it just comes naturally to refer to them that way. Should animals get rights? I think they should in terms to, of their bodily autonomy. I think we should give them those rights. And that's why um, some people are pushing for different animals to have personhood so that we can't exploit them the way we do. Trillions of individuals who are suffering in extraordinary ways every single day. The basic facts about farming are very uncomfortable. Um, most anyone who's going to take a look at the videos that we see come out of farms is going to feel really uncomfortable about the kinds of lives that those animals have. And the more time you spend with animals and the more you learn about the kinds of capacities that they have, the more familiar they seem to the animals you already know and care about, like cats and dogs, the more uncomfortable it becomes. Uh, animals wouldn't be suffering if we weren't producing them for food. There are also lots of environmental problems that would be mitigated. It takes a lot of land to produce the grain and soybeans that feed the animals we want to eat. We wouldn't have to use as much land. We wouldn't have to use all the water. We wouldn't have the runoff problems. We wouldn't have the methane emissions from cattle and from pigs. We wouldn't have the ongoing threats of pandemics from zoonotic diseases. We wouldn't have the diseases of affluence that come along with high meat consumption, right? So there's a wide range of ways in which we could be much better off with either meat minimalist or meat-free diets, and they're within reach. Most people living in urban centers now have access to those kinds of foods and could make those switches, right? They could make those changes. Um, the culture, of course, discourages that, but cultures can change. And the more we learn, the more compelling the case for taking animals seriously becomes, and the more respect it seems to me that they're owed. Ask your children, what do they know about farmed animals? They know the noises they make, and they know that they eat, uh, and that's about it, right? I mean, not a whole lot. And then you start learning about, oh, well, look, you know, chickens can engage in transitive inference, and bees can play, and, you know, uh, the sociality in uh, honeybees is surprisingly complicated, and the navigation strategies in these shrimp um, is, you know, unparalleled, and octopuses can camouflage themselves in these sorts of ways. And the, the list of abilities of these animals, the ways in which they surprise us, the ways that um, we underestimate them, largely through not looking, is really staggering. They're gonna fight now. See, the one underneath is unhappy. Stop it. So it's not allowed to do that. Thank you. This is uh, probably one of the best examples of how humans can change and how animals can influence our culture. So this is an album that came out about 50 years ago. Roger Payne was this scientist and he was studying whales and he noticed that when they made these communications, these sounds, that they had structures like song. So he published a research paper in Science, it was the front cover of Science, it was a big deal in Science, but the cool thing he did was he realised that this was a tool for helping to save the whales. A lot of conservationists have seen this opportunity to build empathy between humans and animals. If you could understand what another animal was saying, you would care more about it. I would. If I could understand like what the squirrels in my garden were saying to each other, maybe I wouldn't chase them away from the bird feeder sometimes. Um, I think if you could have subtitles in an abattoir, it would make a lot of vegans. 
um, would it be so easy for us to eat animals knowing they talk? A lot of people can eat a pigeon, but they find it more difficult to eat a parrot. Is that because parrots speak? They're a little bit more like us? If we can understand the communications of these animals, we can see more explicitly things that we just sense at the moment. What they want, how they interact, what their lives could be like if we didn't mess them up so much. So Roger and many of the other scientists think that these new AI tools could do this again. The more we learn about the animals, the more compassion we feel for them. Diana Rice is a dolphin expert. She discovered that dolphins recognize themselves in a mirror. But she also found that dolphins show playful behavior by producing rings in the water. These kinds of studies have changed the way people feel about dolphins. But have they also made us draw up better legislation? Okay. All righty, thank you so much. Appreciate your help. It's not just about applying science that gives us policy changes. We, have, we, as a, we as a species, we as humanity have to think about, given the fact that we learned about these animals in this way, that we know that these are highly sentient, highly social animals with this level of social and self-awareness, how are we going to treat them? And, you know, we're hopeful that it will have effects on ethics and policy, because it really is a matter of ethics. How do we take those facts? How do we take that information that we know now? What do we do with that information? How do we act as a species? Although most countries now prohibit the hunting of dolphins and whales, Norway still does it. As a scientist, Diana is committed to Valdemir, the escaped beluga. A beautiful, white whale that was termed spy whale. He, he kind of hit the news. Either escaped or was released from Russian water several years ago, and he's now, this beautiful beluga whale named Valdemir is in Norwegian waters, and people in Norway have fallen in love with him. So now we have a town in Norway that wants to build the first whale sanctuary. One of the things that struck me as a scientist over all these years is that it's easier for us to wrap our heads around one individual, one lost whale, um, than it is to protect a whole species or populations. And for that reason, I think it's important for those of us who study cognition and communication to share the information at that level about who these animals are. These are animals with individual personalities. We now have frameworks to talk about personality in animals. That was taboo for years. My hope is that the more we appreciate them as individuals living in social groups like us, caring for young, showing empathy for others, even outside of their own species often, we're gonna to relate to that. We're looking over the East River and what's really cool is that we've seen a recurrence now of dolphins and several different species of dolphins and also in the general area, humpback whales, more in the harbor area of New York City. And why do you think that is? Well, the thought is that the water may be a lot cleaner than it's been. That's one factor. It may also be due to the um, reoccurrence of a particular fish species, menhaden, uh, the, that the animals are eating, that they're following these fish stocks up here. So it's exciting. Apparently, it's not that hard. Animals need a healthy ecosystem, clean water, free from pollution, and enough food. We're more and more convinced that we mustn't use rivers as rubbish tips. But not everyone is there yet. One of the most polluted ecosystems in Europe is the River Meuse, and the foulest part flows through the Netherlands. Oh, sterk ook ja, ik heb laatst die getallen ergens gehoord. Bizar veel koeien. Ja, van koeien. Ja. Voornamelijk de blikjes, dat metaal. Ja. En die hebben zeven, die zeven magen. Dus als die eenmaal dat metaal in zo'n maag hebben, dan gaat dat helemaal terug en abonneren en dan. 
En dan zie je hier zo'n stukje plastic, die worden zo klein. En vissen denken dat dat voedsel is. Je eet het op. Of het stroomt door naar de oceaan. Die vissen eten het op. En dan ligt het op ons bordje. We weten ook dat er heel veel nanoplastics uit, uit de kleren, uit de cosmetica, dat komt in ons rioolstelsel terecht en dat komt via de riooloverstorter in onze maas terecht. Maar ook heel veel via lozingen. Gemmelod is een zo'n lozingsplek waar, waar ook geloos mag worden. Mag allemaal binnen vergunningen, maar dat is natuurlijk absurd. En zo zijn er nog 2000 plekken in die maas waar plastic geloos mag worden. All over the world. Rivers and nature reserves are given legal rights, which started in the American town of Tamaqua. Examples are the Wanganui River in New Zealand and a lagoon near Mercia in Spain. Jessica Den Outer and Noy Boosten are part of a Dutch organization called Moes in Law, a citizen's initiative to make the river Moes a legal entity too. Wij vinden dat de Maas rechten moet krijgen. En dat is in dat opzicht helemaal geen nieuw idee. Rivieren over de hele wereld krijgen nu rechten. Het is echt een steeds groter opkomende beweging. En ja, wat we zien met de Maas Cleanup, hè, onze opruimacties zijn hartstikke belangrijk. Maar we willen ook structureel een oplossing voor dit probleem. Dat een van de rechten die de Maas zou moeten hebben, het recht zou moeten zijn om vrij te zijn van vervuiling. We hebben een verantwoordelijkheid om op te staan voor de belangen van de rest van de natuur. Die misschien niet zo'n stem hebben zoals wij en hun belangen zo kunnen uitspreken. Met recht voor de natuur stel je dus vertegenwoordigers aan. En die voogden hebben dus een verantwoordelijkheid om te spreken namens de natuur. Dus die nemen die ecologische belangen mee. En ja, het recht ontwikkelt zich altijd. Wij mensen hebben rechten. Ooit hadden vrouwen het recht niet om te stemmen. Ooit waren we tot slaafgemaakte eigendom. Nou, zo'nzelfde juridische emancipatie zouden we moeten doormaken voor de natuur. En nu in 2023 zijn er wel 409 wereldwijde initiatieven en 37 landen die dit hebben vastgelegd in wet- en regelgeving. He, Moeder Aarde in Ecuador die rechten heeft, uh, Rivier in Nieuw-Zeeland die rechtspersoonlijkheid heeft. Dus het verspreidt zich over de hele wereld en nu ook naar Europa. Wat wij zien in de praktijk, dat keer op keer die economische belangen de overhand krijgen boven ecologische belangen. In dit geval hier mag je 14.000 kilo microplastic mag je per jaar mag je lozen rond de Gemmenot. En dat is dan een van de strengste vergunningen. Ik denk wel één Olympisch zwembad per week, alleen op deze plek al. Dat is natuurlijk heel raar dat we in deze tijd nog überhaupt een vergunning verlenen voor het schoon pakken van drinkwater uit een ecosysteem en dat vies mogen terugleveren. Dat is totaal niet meer te begrijpen. Het mag gewoon. Dit accepteren wij als samenleving dat we zoveel plastic in de Maas laten vloeien. Los van de natuur, de dieren, de vogels, de vissen die hier afhangen. 7 miljoen mensen, geloof ik, ja. België en Nederland gecombineerd... Ja. die afhankelijk zijn van de Maas voor drinkwater. Ja. Dus zelfs niet eens vanuit het oogpunt van natuur alleen zou je al zeggen... dit kan niet. Nee, nee helemaal niet. Het wordt ook heel vaak wordt, wordt het drinkwatergewin wordt stopgezet. Eh, omdat het dan inderdaad zo'n lage waterstand is... dat de concentratie giftige stof veel hoog is. En dan is het dus niet meer veilig voor, voor drinkwater. En dat vinden wij heel normaal, dat dat voor dieren, die moeten daar gewoon maar in leven, zeg maar. Dat, terwijl als onze kinderen daarin zouden zitten, ja, dan zou Nederland op de kop staan. Dan zouden we het nooit accepteren dat, dat het op die manier vervuild werd. Ook na de watersnoodramp in eh, 2021 was dat. Die geur wat er blijft hangen van die overstromingen, ja, dat, dat was gewoon echt ziekmakend. De, de smurrie die achterblijft met alle rotzooi, je mocht er ook echt niet in. Je, het was gewoon echt gevaarlijk wat er allemaal in zat. Voedsel ook, de akkers mochten ook niet meer verbouwen wat, wat overstroomd waren. Dus de maïs mocht niet meer geteeld worden. Het was echt wel uh, troep. En dan besef je pas, en dan ruik je ook echt hoe, hoe vies die maas is. En dan besef je eigenlijk, van, het is überhaupt niet normaal dat we hier niet gewoon uit kunnen drinken. Zo vervuild is die rivier al. Het ziet er wel helder uit. Ja, het ziet er zeker helder uit. <laughs> Ik mag een slokje proberen van mij, maar het is... Uh... place on earth to legally recognize the rights of nature was Tamaqua, a small conservative mining town in Pennsylvania. A poor town 
where businesses thought they could dump their waste without too much trouble. But those businesses didn't reckon with Kathy Murelli, a member of the town council. On the 19th of September 2006, Tamaqua passed a historic bylaw. This is where I sat. An ordinance to protect the health, safety, and general welfare of the citizens and environment of Tamaqua Borough by recognizing and enforcing the rights of residents to defend natural communities and ecosystems, and by otherwise adopting the Pennsylvania regulations concerning the land application of sewage sludge. Four people had this rare cancer on the same road that happened to sit beneath where the truck's pulling up and, and you know, dumping barrels and tonnages of chemicals. And at the time, I think the CDC or the Department of Health was saying that that particular cancer, polycythemia vera, occurred in like one in 200 or 250,000 people. We sort of considered ourselves to be a dumping ground here because we had um, we had a site, the McAdoo Associate site, uh, which was um, I think back in the 70s was when all that dumping. Um, companies just came there and dumped barrels. Trucks would come in the middle of the night and just dump like tonnages of liquid down mine shafts. Uh, there was a battery, an old battery plant um, that sat on another other end of, of the Tamako School District itself. I, I, they started to dump here. Yeah. And then the other mountain, the, that, this mountain, I would live on the other side of that, on that. And I remember, <clears throat> as I sit here, it takes me back. Because it's kind of subtle in here, you know, the defend natural communities and ecosystems. And if my memory serves me correctly, I remember the president saying, so you want to give rights to ecosystems. I remember him saying that. I do. And I remember him being kind of outraged by the whole thing. We like to pretend with our clothes and our beautiful cameras that, we, that we're sort of different from other species. But we're not different. We have to eat, we have to breathe, we need clean water. Um, we need a stable ecosystem, we need the temperatures to remain the same, we need predictable weather. All of these things depend on ecosystems of different species, like lives, interweaving with each other. At the moment, the most scary thing is all the insects going, because they're at the bottom of the ecosystem. They turn over the soil and the ground, they eat pests, they, they pollinate plants. Without the insects, all the things that are further up the food chain, and we're at the top, we're in the most vulnerable position. Like, if you were in a house of cards and you started taking out cards from the bottom, the last place you want to be is at the top. Can you see their green leaves? Look, this is a cherry. This is a cherry. Cherry. The cherry has got blossom on it. This is a tree. Can you see any squirrels? Squirrels? Squirrels. That's the bark. 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 That's the outside of the tree. Bark. Bark. Can you see up? Can you see the branches? Look up. Up there, look. Can you see branches? Branches. I think, although it's really sad time, I think many human beings are being much kinder to animals than we've been in our entire history. But it's not happening fast enough. You know, we, we're in an extinction crisis, a biodiversity crisis. Um, but the, the other side of it, aside from conservation, is just wonder. So if you can't see the bird, but you can just hear them, you can use your phone to find out who they are. Should we do that? Go. That's it. All around us, in all of our lives, are these, you know, communications between animals. If I go to the park, 
and I see the crows calling to each other, I wanna know what they're saying. I know they're not just saying the same thing over and over. I know that to, to do this effort for them, to, to like disrupt their lives and spend time talking to each other, there must be some important information being transferred. But for so long, we have been unwilling to try and dis, like find out what it is. You can hear it. Can you hear it? Chip, chip, chip. Chip, chip, chip. Should we go and find some more? What? You go find some more. OK, let's go. It's really exciting right now because it feels like in the human culture, we care. We, it's not controversial to think that different animals have different personalities. It's not controversial to think that they think in complex ways or communicate. And now, at the same time as that cultural change, we have these tools to investigate it. Oh yeah, that's it. Can you hear it? It's doing up there now. Chip, 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 chip. What a time to be alive. That these fantasy stories that we used to tell children about talking animals that you could understand. My daughter, I think it's very possible she would be able to talk to animals. If I'd have said this five years ago, I wouldn't have believed it. But seeing all of these tools and seeing all these people who are very clever applying themselves with these tools, taking this seriously, um, gives me a lot of hope. Yeah, look, there it is up there. There it is. I look at some of the stuff that like the big tech guys are doing and I find it quite boring. And I'm not interested in Mars. I think Mars is a boring place to go. But the sea is full of giant animals with huge brains that have been around for tens of millions of years. They might be the only other intelligent life in the universe and they're right next to us. And we have a chance to talk to them, to understand how they see the world. Like, I think if there is a moment, the first two-way conversation between another species and us, that will be huge in our culture. Like, it will be like the photograph of Earth from space. We'll understand our context. Why has an animal communication been taken as seriously as finding subatomic particles or distant galaxies? Like, why don't we have a human genome project for animal communication? Basically, we have aliens living uh, literally under our feet, right? Or something that is as close as possible to, to Martians on Earth uh, that, that live in a completely different environment, communicate in a completely different way, and yet somehow we look into the sky rather than looking into the sea. So, so yeah. I don't know why. I don't have an explanation. It drives me mad. I feel yeah. it's like it would be like so farcical if they went extinct and then we went to Mars and or just explored the universe and there was nothing else. And we were like, oh, that was our chance. Yeah, yeah. because. With extraterrestrial uh, hypothetical creatures, we have never actually observed anyone. With whales, we see them all the time, right? Yeah. And we know that they're intelligent. Uh, they know that we know that they communicate in some complex way. So that would be probably, uh, how to say, a low-hanging fruit to study, so to say. Low-hanging whales. Yeah. yeah. You don't have to be like a human to be impressive in some dimension or another, right? You don't have to look like a human. You don't have to do it the way a human would to be intelligent. Um, to recognize that all of these concepts that we use, like intelligence, are concepts that need to be made more granular, more precise. They need to be nuanced in all sorts of ways to allow us to detect what really is special about the mental lives of different kinds of animals. Those kinds of revolutions, scientific revolutions, I think we might be getting fairly close to, or perhaps, perhaps some of those revolutions have happened. Um, the moral revolutions, the political revolutions, that's much further out. Listening to the voice of nature may be the most challenging task of the coming decades, but it is the key to a livable future. Ik denk op het eerste oog lijkt het goed geregeld in Nederland, maar we luisteren niet naar de natuur. Ik denk dat dat de kern is. En alles is ook met elkaar verbonden. Ecosystemen, wij hangen er vanaf, dieren hangen er vanaf. Als het niet goed gaat met de rivier, gaat het niet goed met de dieren, gaat het niet goed met ons. Ik denk dat dat heel belangrijk is.